Okay, guys, we're gonna talk about diabetes mellitus. Now, even if you're brand new into nursing school, you've probably heard about this, or you know someone who has it, or you've at least heard about it on the news. Diabetes is one of the leading comorbidities in the US, and it's a serious problem for our patients. In this lesson, we're gonna review what happens in the patient's body with diabetes mellitus, and in the next lesson, we're gonna talk about what we do about it medically and in our nursing care. So first, let's look at basic patho. Diabetes is an immune disorder that attacks the beta cells of the pancreas. Those are the cells responsible for secreting insulin. So if the beta cells are attacked, we either have a lack of insulin or an insufficient supply of insulin for our body's needs. So let's remind ourselves of what insulin does. Well, insulin is the key that unlocks the cell so that glucose can actually get inside. If this a cell is not unlocked by insulin, then the glucose channel is closed, it can't get in and it stops on the outside. So without that key to get glucose into the cells, the amount of glucose hanging out outside the cell is going to go up, hence our increased blood sugar levels. Now there's two types, type one and type two, so let's look at each of those a little closer. In type one diabetes mellitus, patients have absolutely no insulin production. All of the beta cells in their pancreas have been destroyed. They've completely lost their ability to produce insulin. So remember, normally the insulin is gonna unlock the cells and it's gonna help glucose move into the cells. If I have zero insulin, then all of my glucose is gonna end up hanging out out in the bloodstream because it can't actually get into the cells and the cells get nothing. But the cells require glucose for energy, so they're gonna have to find it another way, and that can create a lot of problems for the patient, as we'll see in the DKA lesson. So as you can imagine, these patients are considered insulin dependent. Now, this used to be also called juvenile onset diabetes or juvenile diabetes, but they found that it can actually develop later in life as well, so we stick to type one or insulin dependent diabetes. Now, in type 2 diabetes mellitus, the patient is making some insulin. However, one of two things are happening. Either they just aren't making enough to deal with what their body needs in that excess blood glucose, or their body has become resistant to the effect of insulin. So if the body is resistant, it requires much more insulin to have the same effect, but their body just isn't providing it. So we have some cells that are able to get some glucose, but the rest of that blood sugar is gonna stay here in the bloodstream. Now the difference here is that the body is getting just enough blood sugar to be able to um, function and carry out vital functions. So it doesn't have to find that same workaround like type one does. Now we'll talk about that more in the HHNS lesson. Now they used to call this adult, adult onset, but more and more we're seeing children diagnosed because of poor lifestyle and eating habits. So just remember type one is no insulin and type two is not enough insulin or insulin resistance, okay? Either way, the blood sugars become dangerously elevated. So there's a few complications of having those really elevated blood sugars, which we're gonna to continue to look at throughout this module. But one of the biggest ones we want you to see is the amount of damage it causes in the vascular system. We always say diabetes is a vascular disorder. Elevated blood sugars are gonna cause inflammation and hyperosmolarity within the vessels. At the, it's that super concentrated state because of all the blood sugar. And both of those things are gonna do damage to the vessels themselves as well as to the nerves around them. So patients tend to have poor circulation, especially in the small vessels like in the hands and the feet that poor circulation plus the inflammation is going to lead to poor wound healing. Their wounds are not gonna get enough blood flow, they're not gonna get um, enough circulation and they're gonna have too much inflammation, it's gonna be difficult to heal. So you'll see in nursing care, we'll talk about inspecting every inch of their skin, especially on their feet, between their toes, because even the smallest wound can become massive and infected and they could lose their foot, their toe, even their leg because of it. Now the other thing we'll see is um, neuropathy, that's because of the damage to those nerves. So they'll get things like numbness and tingling. Again, especially in their hands and feet, those smaller nerves, those smaller vessels. Um, and of course that just makes the poor wound healing worse because they can't feel when something's going wrong. They can't feel that they have a wound there. 
Now we'll also see retinopathy, again, small vessels in the eyes, and then nephropathy, which is um, the kidneys. So patients will um, have uh, blurry vision and then they may end up having trouble with their kidneys later in life. Um, ultimately, all patients with diabetes are at risk for chronic kidney disease if their sugars aren't well controlled. There's a couple other complications we want you to um, know about, especially for patients receiving sub-Q insulin, because it drives the things that we do as nurses. Lipoatrophy, I think atrophy means shrinking, that's a loss of sub-Q fat, and lipohypertrophy is an extra growth or fat mass, and this is at the site of your sub-Q insulin injection, okay? So this is why we rotate sites. Now we'll split the abdomen into quadrants so that we can rotate our injection sites, but we can also actually split each quadrant into a quadrant. We want to rotate as much as we can. We can also use, you know, the backs of the arms. We could use the outer thigh. Anywhere where there's a fat pad, you can use it. So make sure that you are rotating sites. Otherwise, we're going to see this issue with the sub-Q fat at that site. Now, the other thing we tend to see is two things called Dawn phenomenon and the Simoji phenomenon. Dawn phenomenon says that their sensitivity decreases in the morning to insulin, and so their blood sugars will be a little higher in the morning. And the Simoji phenomenon says if their blood sugar is low at night, then they're going to have this rebound hyperglycemia in the morning. So with both of these, we're going to see an increased blood glucose in the AM. So just be aware of that. This is something that was super frustrating for me working in the ICU because the surgeons wanted blood sugars super controlled by 6 a.m. And all my sugars would be wonderful, you know, my, my 10 p.m., my 3 a.m., and then I'd get to 6.30 in the morning and it would be like, 250 because of these phenomena. So just be aware um, for Dawn phenomenon. Sometimes if we give them um, an evening dose of insulin, that can help avoid that. With Simoji, if we give them um, a bedtime snack, sometimes that can avoid it. And then of course, the other two big complications are going to be DKA or HHNS, which each have their own lesson. So make sure you look at those. Let's recap. Diabetes mellitus is a condition of insufficient insulin production or action, either because all of their beta cells have been destroyed and they have no insulin, like in type 1, or because they just aren't producing enough or they're resistant to it in type 2. Now, because the glucose can't enter the cells to be used without insulin, we're going to see this significant hyperglycemia. That hyperglycemia leads to inflammation and hyperosmolarity, which causes significant vascular damage, especially to the small vessels and nerves, like in the hands, in the feet, the eyes, and the kidneys. Those are the most important things that you're going to see with these patients. So we want to work on preventing those complications. We want to rotate injection sites so we prevent issues with their sub-Q fat. We want to consider their evening routine. Do they need a snack? Do they need a bedtime dose of insulin? And then, of course, we're going to monitor for signs and symptoms of exacerbations like DKA or HHNS, which, again, have their own lessons. Make sure you check those out. Thanks for watching another Nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on Nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.